Welcome to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and today the Poison Pen is honored to have with us two distinguished authors, Rory O'Neill Schmidt and Rosary O'Neill. Their latest book is Edgar Degas in New Orleans. And before we begin today, I'd like to let those listening in know the Poison Pen does have copies of the book, and we would be delighted to hold one for you or put one in the mail. Just give us a call or go online to the Poison Pen Bookstore. And now I'd like to welcome Rory and Rosary. Hi, John Charles. We're so happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we begin, I know as a reader, I'm always fascinated by who an author was before they started writing. And you both have such impressive resumes. Can you tell us a little bit about who you were before you began your Edgar Degas project? And I'll let you decide who wants to start. I'm happy to, to go first. Um, I, I think that some writers are always writers. I, okay. I think as a child, um, I kind of knew that I loved writing and I was curious about it and I was inspired by different things, art, and nature, and travel. Um, but before I became a, a, a writer for this book, I actually worked as a board certified art therapist. Um, so I, I lived in San Diego, lived in New York, and I really felt that art is a, can be a catalyst to heal and to transform. Um, and so that was my profession before I um, moved into a university position and um, focus more on my writing. But I'll turn it over to, to Rosary, my mother, and my co-author to, to share more about you too, Mom. Rory's always been a very gifted artist and a very humble artist, which makes her wonderful. I've had like eight Fulbrights to Paris, yeah. which is one of the greatest thrills of my life. And living in Paris in the basement apartment, looking for ways to amuse my children. Uh, you could go to museums for free. So every day we would go to a museum and she fell in love at the age of, I don't know, 10 years old with Edgar Degas. And I fell kind of in love with the Impressionists because they're so beautiful. So one of our reasons to go back to Paris and we did go for 10 summers. Can you imagine such a thing? Because I was a full-time professor at Loyola University, New Orleans and the marvelous Jesuits had money for travel for scholars and faculty who wanted to go someplace. So every summer I would work to get an invitation to Paris and off the three of us would go, Rory complaining that she didn't want to spend another summer in Paris. I mean, it was, now she can't believe she was so arrogant to accept that. But that's how we first uh, came in touch with Edgar Degas. And then uh, as time unfolded, his story was so scandalous and so mysterious in New Orleans that of course we became like sleuths wanting to find out what was the real story of Edgar Degas in New Orleans. Oh, no one knew in France. Really, that's interesting because that brings us to your new project. I mean, I think a lot of people know a little bit about Degas and they think of him as his ballet paintings or his races or things like that, but they don't think of him in New, or New Orleans. So what prompted you to write this book and I think at some point you had said Degas would not be the artist today. We know today if he had not spent part of his life in Orleans. And how did that really factor into his career? Right. Well, I, I think that as New Orleanians, um, there we are really proud of our culture, our tortured history, our recovery. It seems like we're always trying to recover from one disaster to the next. And the fact that Edgar Degas, uh, his mother was born in New Orleans. He comes from a long line of Louisiana um, ancestors. That was something that really inspired us. And, um, you know, I studied art history for a long time. And his American lineage was never something that was really focused on or shared. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's really important for the world to know that Degas is half American, I'll say, you know, his mother was American, and that him coming to New Orleans before he became extremely successful launching the Impressionist movement, living in Louisiana for six months during Re Reconstruction, um, really searching his soul to find out who he was and what type of art he wanted to make. It was through those family relationships, and I think at that special time, um, you know, he did create his first masterpiece, the Cotton Office in New Orleans, that is still celebrated today. And it was a really prolific time. So I think for us, we wanted to, you know, share this history with the world that has been hidden um, for, for so long, for whatever reasons. And we're really excited about the book and all that we've learned. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it um, was such a mystery? Why, why was his connection hidden? Well... 
it was a lot of scandal and abuse that was hidden. Oh. When I say that, and Rory and I were astonished. Rory has a, a PhD in art history. I have a PhD in theater. And so we had studied the history of New Orleans. I wrote my actual dissertation on carnival in New Orleans, but we never knew Edgar was here, nor did we know about this family that was hidden. And it was because uh, there was a scandal that was suppressed by the family itself. Uh, Edgar Degas' brother had several children by a very uh, lovely woman who he who was going blind. This is the woman in the painting, the portrait of Estelle. Well, she was going blind and the woman who was reading to her, her next door neighbor, was having an affair with her husband, Edgar Degas' brother, Rene Degas, in the house while Edgar was trying to do these paintings. There was this affair going on from the woman next door. His brother eventually left, fled with his mistress to Paris and married her bigamously. Mm-hmm. Edgar was so infuriated by this that he refused to talk to his brother. And everyone in Louisiana changed their name from Degas to the mother's maiden name, as was the tradition of shame. In other words, if you were divorced and shamed by your husband, you took on your father's name. In this case, it was Musson. And so no one knew that Degas had come to New Orleans for a century, including us. We didn't know it either. And finally, it was discovered, maybe Warwick can talk a little bit about how it was uncovered, this scandalous uh, story of Edgar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that within the family, Estelle Mousson, who outlived everyone, um, and she, she overcame so much, she secretly let her children know what their lineage was. Um, and they actually ended up inheriting half of Edgar Degas' estate when he passed because it had gone to his brother, Rene. Um, they had made up after 10 years of not talking, his mm-hmm. brother, who was his best friend. Um, and I think Edgar was so ashamed that uh, his brother would desert, literally deserted his family, his five children, um, you know, didn't visit, didn't care when children died, didn't care when his sister-in-law died, he just abandoned everyone. Um, And so this is a point of real shame, but the glory of Degas' artwork and who he became, um, I think is really something that's still cherished. And when we go, we went to three book signings in Louisiana and in Mississippi, in each one, we actually met a descendant of, uh, of his grandmother or his family side. So it shows that you know, there are still some people in Louisiana who are related to Degas and who are still celebrating um, who he was and, and the artwork. You know, he has celebrated, some scholars say, as one of the best artists who ever lived. Mm. And I just think if he hadn't have, you know, sometimes in life we have these transformative experiences, whether it's, mm. you know, study abroad in China in college, like I did, that kind of changed how I looked at the world, or, or visiting your Louisiana uh cousins in 1872 and and your two brothers who lived there too and his uncle um that time i think was so important for him on deciding who he was as a french person and an artist and then who he was really forcing himself to um become um now degas had been training as an artist before he came to america i think primarily in italy and france right but right right america kind of opened him up to a different way of looking at art is that a way of seeing this journey yes i think it was the pain of it all i mean it was a horror it was uh, horrifying actually not only uh this experience of his brother but the fact that his uncle's cotton business that he thought was doing well went bankrupt while Edgar was there. And he actually painted this painting of the cotton office, putting a pastina, a beauty over it. But it was a horrible day. They were all going bankrupt when he was there. So the whole world, as he knew it, was was sort of falling apart. And his father's banks in Naples and in Paris were going bankrupt trying to save the Louisiana people. And they eventually did go bankrupt. So I think when Edgar began to paint, he was painting out of a misery and horror. And even mm-hmm. though the paintings are sort of still and poetic, there is this immense grief behind them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think too, to look at the visual art aspect of it, I mean, something we learned from uh, Dr. Gail Feigenbaum, who was the curator who really helped bring all of Degas' artworks um, up into public view in 1999 with the New Orleans Museum of Art um, exhibition. You know, looking at specifically 
the paintings, the light and the use of light and how light shone through the huge windows in, in on Esplanade Avenue, you know, in New Orleans and how the colors of the foliage of the tropical plants or something that he hadn't seen too. And we were talking with uh, Dr. Isolde Pudemacher, the Paris chief curator of Degas' work at the Musée d'Orsay. And she said, even the windows, these details, that doesn't, that didn't exist in France. It, his whole world was so different um, in New Orleans and he he painted it. He got inside a house of, I think there was 18 people living there at the time. And this is a, a, a bachelor, <laughs> this is an artist from France coming in and he's, you know, living with his uncle and his, his three women cousins and all these children running around and his brother. And it's like, he had this inner glimpse into a world, this interior world of women. Mm -hmm. Um, and he became fascinated. And in order to continue to paint women and to get close inside of their world, you know, we were talking with another curator and art historian, Dr. Barbara Blomick. He had to hire prostitutes to paint. He had to go into a theater and and paint the dancers because like his cousin, he had a, a, an eye disease and he was going blind himself. So he was inspired by that beauty and that pain and, and um, that transferred through his whole life, we think. Mm -hmm. So insightful. Um, let's talk a little bit about New Orleans itself, too, because I really don't know that much about it. And I know more after reading your book, but it was mm -hmm. not exactly a safe place in the 1870s. I mean, there was the reconstruction going on. There was yellow fever. There was political unrest. There was financial instability. What about New Orleans made it such a hot spot, I guess, for all these things? Well, I'm living here now in New Orleans, and I can just tell you two days ago, I had a roast, a roach infestation. You never <laughs> know, a roach infestation. You, you, I can't even imagine it in New York or in California, in which roaches were coming in from the ceiling light down the <laughs> in the bathroom, and I slept with three cans of rain around me, shooting me <laughs> in a house that had, had Terminex previously the week before a visit. So the, one of the things I, I think that's sort of horrific about New Orleans and sort of interesting is the amount of reptiles there are here all over the place. And you, we think about the um, fact that people dump their trash and refuse in the street, you can imagine. And even now, after Hurricane, um, I think, Ida last summer, we now have possums. And I, I said, I thought I saw a rat on the roof. And the exterminator said, what kind of rat? We have a good rat. I'm like, God, I didn't even know how to classify the kind of rodents I had. But I'm just giving you a, a sense that in a tropical climate, uh, there's a lot more disease in some ways and a lot more shocking things that happen. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. It was and and it, was, it, it was a terrible time of, um, of of disease too. It was so dangerous that before he and his brother got on the train to decide to land it, and they flew into New York and came down to New Orleans, is was New Orleans safe enough? They actually sent a, a telegram just to find out: uh, Can we enter? Or should we go to Bay St. Louis instead? Is it is it safe enough to even enter? And you know, we're thinking about this during the pandemic, and you know, that was one. Well, you know, not being able to know if you're safe to go outside or who you can to spend mm -hmm. time with, but. Um, it was treacherous. Um, and I think Reconstruction, Louisiana, you know, he had heard stories growing up. Edgar Degas, his mother died when he was 13, but he grew up listening to stories from his his mom about this beautiful, wonderful, marvelous place. And then he gets there and I it's awful. Things are falling apart. People, there's no sewage. There's no, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's dirty, it's hot. Uh, you know, there's violence in the streets. There's political unrest. We, we talked about that in the book too, yeah. and um, how people were losing power and coming into power, and how mm -hmm. they used carnival as a way to mask and to politicize institu institutional racism. I mean, it was a terrible, yeah. ugly time. And I think Edgar had to choose: Do I stay here mm -hmm. because I love these people, or do I get out? Um, right. And it was actually his father who was thrown into jail. Uh, mm -hmm. with bankruptcy that he decided that he had to go back to France mm -hmm. and he had to sketch as many paintings and pastels of these Degas dancers to get his father out of, of jail. And that is another point of shame mm -hmm. that he didn't want to tell people about what was happening. And one art critic actually wrote about that and he didn't talk to the art critic ever again. They stopped being friends because you that sense of shame and family honor um, was a big value in 18, um, 1870s. 
Um, yeah, well, it was actually in New Orleans something called the suicide oak tree where men hung themselves because they were in such a state of despair. And also the dueling oaks where men fought over, uh, you know, being insulted and various things. And now we, of course, do not celebrate the suicide oak tree. Uh, my daughter, Rochelle, who took a picture of it on the back of the, of the book, uh, you know, we don't want to encourage suicide. So it, it, there's no plot to that one at all. If you come here, you have to kind of search that one down. But that was um, a fairly popular place because so many men lost all their money. And I say men because primarily men were the wage earners at, at that time. So it was a difficult, I think it was a difficult time. No question it was, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about how you went about researching the book because there's so much information in such a concise format. I mean, you have these wonderful little nuggets. Like I had no idea that Nor there were more duels held in Nor New Orleans than any other American city. And that's just kind of sprinkled amongst all the other facts you have. But I know you talked to curators and historians and you've done, what was the research like for this? How long did you have to work at it was this um a huge project i'm sure it was we we probably spent i don't know two two or two and a half years on us writing the book together but we you know i'd studied art for a long time and studied Ga, and my co-author had also studied the story for a long time but i think that as it as a team, when we had the book contract, this is actually our fourth book with Arcadia Publishing, um, we really focused on what can we bring to light right now? What's the new knowledge we can share? How are people looking at this um, today? And initially with doing research, you know, um, some people would say, oh, it's already been written. You know, and, you know, I got the main book, it's a beautiful job, uh, but we wanted to know more. And has it been written by, to mm. people who grew up in New Orleans who experienced it. And um, so we, of course, did the research, read all the books, even uh, the Tulane Library, they have a vault of the Degas Mousson papers. So yeah. we read the papers in French and in English because you can see a lot from, you know, the art of the, the letter back then, which was so um, poetic. And um, even Rene in one of the letters tells that when his brother Edgar got back to Paris after New Orleans, he was enchanted. So despite all that misery, he was still inspired. Um, we also interviewed curators and uh, art historians. I think the pinnacle was uh, going to Paris to finish the, the research. Uh, we went to the Musée d'Orsay library and one of the paintings that I'm sure was Estelle, uh, his cousin, Actually, I found in in the, looking through all of their their work that it actually was titled Estelle for over 130 years, and then it was recently changed. But there's not really a rationale as to why. So there's still mystery about who were some of these women. What was mm -hmm. the relationship between him and Estelle like? Um, was it a tender? There's definitely tenderness there, but he painted her the most of all the relatives. Um, and that was really incredible to see too their relationship. Um, and of course, looking at the artwork, what do what do we see? Um, looking at the the um, the rehearsal, um, my mom talked a little bit about that. You know, a rehearsal for singing—that's how people entertained back then. And with the next door neighbor, who by the way was seventeen at the time, a <laughs> newly married, and the music teacher of Renee and Estelle's children in the house. Okay, and she was reading the Bible to Estelle, and she was also teaching Estelle music. And so, knowing all that context, you look at the painting a little bit differently. You look at the voyeur of Renee, a blur behind the piano, kind of turned on by this. This and this the guy standing in this doorway painting this, like what is happening here? So uh, we 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 uh, took more. Um, we made the art more personal. We really tried to get inside of, of their bodies and their minds and their souls to understand what were what was he painting? Why was he painting it? And is any of it still meaningful today? With your background in art, um, do you mm -hmm. think artists are always bringing something of themselves like they got to their work? Is it impossible for them to divorce themselves from what they produce? Roy? Well, I think for me as a writer, um, the best things I write are, are really the things that I'm either blaming someone for or ashamed about. <laughs> you know, I, I hope no one reads this, but I'm going to say it. And it's like, 
Okay, tell me now, I'm interested. So yeah, you know, the things you really don't want to identify as yourself later on are probably the, the only things really unique about, about mm -hmm. you. Uh, what, I, what I also want to say is that, you know, Edgar's cousins visited Paris during and France during the Civil War. In other words, they had, came from wealth and their father had sent them over there to save them. So they already had his three cousins, a very deep relationship with Edgar and his two brothers. So that certainly must have been a horror for Edgar to have known them as young and successful and beautiful in Paris and then to see them so destitute and infirm, if you will, in New Orleans when he came. That, that sudden shock in life where if someone dies or someone falls over, you don't expect it to happen. That has got to grip you as an artist. And that was the, the, the starting point for, for Edgar's hope in himself as a painter. When he went back, he, he the Salon of Impressionism, he called Le Salon des Refusés, which means the Salon of the Rejected Ones. He saw himself, himself as a rejected one, but he was going to go on anyway because he had seen so much death. Yeah. That was beautiful. Um, I think you always have to bring yourself into the artwork, whether you're aware of it, conscious of what you're expressing or unconscious. Um, I would never uh, divorce the artists from the artwork that they create. I think it's really important. You both have done so much work on this project and so much research. What surprised you the most about Edgar, Edgar Degas? What did you discover about him that you thought this really shocks me, really surprises me. That he was a, had a kind soul and was a compassionate person. I, some of the you, things that we read were that he was cold, but really he was a genius. And he really needed to focus on making his art 24 seven. He didn't have time to become a husband or to have children. And in his letters from New Orleans, he was actually thinking about, about becoming, a, becoming a father at some point in his life. But I think that, um, there's actually Theodore Reff came out with a, a chronicle of all of the letters that Edgar Gada has ever written. <laughs> we, we we read, and when you look at you know his letters from Italy when he was young younger before he came to New Orleans and how he described art and described what he was doing, and then you look at his letters after you know uh, when he was an accomplished art artist and he was writing more about you know sales work or display or how specifically he wanted it displayed and where he wanted it displayed, mm -hmm. and then you look at the the red letters he wrote from New Orleans. And it's like a totally different person. I mean, he was just almost levitating um, with such joy and such fascination um, about uh, the people there and the culture. I was impressed that he was such an honorable person that when his brother went through all the family money that he went back to rescue his father, being a mother myself, and that he worked like a fiend for several years to get his his father's name restored to a place of honor and to pay back all of his father's debts. And that's one way he became a great painter is that he became prolific in doing pastels. He, pastels he could do faster than any other kind of painting and sell. And so no one painted more faster than Degas, but he got it out of trying to save his family's name and restore it. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. That really puts a whole new light on us. Pastel work. Um, this is not the first time you've worked together on a literary project. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, I know I, I can imagine I'm not a writer myself, but it's challenging just to work with another person, let alone with someone who you know quite well. So talk about the whole collaborative process for all of your books. Oh, it's it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful because uh, something about my mom, a little bit like Diga, is that she will work fearlessly, nonstop, until her legs fall asleep in the chair, sitting at the desk writing. Um, she's extremely committed, and she pushed me as a as a child and <laughs> continued to push me in discipline. I'm just so inspired by her discipline. Um, and yeah, mom, did you want to jump in about our? process of working together? Well, I feel like Rory is an improvement of me. So it's really thrilling to work with her. And so I let her be the boss. I say on any decision, if there's a tie, you get to choose what we do. Because I feel like I've been the boss as a mother most of my life. 
And that seems to work great. And she always makes a perfect decision. So that's it. Thank you. I know she says she says I'm the boss, which you know, I'm a middle child. So I, I like that. But uh I'm not sure if I'm really the boss. I just, I just want to keep driving us forward and I, mm. I want to write another 10 books together. So, <laughs> yeah. And your previous book was on New Orleans. Is that correct? Yes. Our previous book uh, came out in 2016. It's called New Orleans Voodoo. Um, and that was just mm. all on another life-changing experience to understand and to study um, the history of voodoo in New Orleans and how voodoo came to New Orleans and to who was celebrated by at who it how it's changed and how it's still you know practiced today as a, a religion um, very serious so we interviewed uh, voodoo priestesses uh, participated in different ceremonies uh, and really got a chance to understand another hidden component of New Orleans history that has been often um, maligned uh, put down, and we really saw the beauty in this religious uh, experience. We wanted to share more about um, what Buddha was. In addition to your books about New Orleans, you live there, you have experience with it. For people that are not familiar with that part of the country that may not have visited, don't have a connection, mm -hmm. what is it about New Orleans that's so magical? Because it's written about, it's portrayed in art, it's in films, it's kind of got that dual appeal of kind of danger aside, and then also mm -hmm. glamour and a faded glory. And I mean, mm -hmm. talk to us, tell us why New Orleans speaks to you. What about it, the city is so great? For me, New Orleans is always home. And I've lived in New York, you know, and right now I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. I've lived in California. But something about the people there and the land, they just pull you back. Uh, when you go home, it's like going back in the womb almost, in that everyone loves you and everyone just wants to party. It's the for a writer and an artist, it's very difficult uh, because there's a lot of distraction. But the love there, they're just accepting of everyone. The food is amazing. Music mm. surrounds you everywhere you go. Um, it's just a thrill to be in the city, um, and it always captivates me. Yeah, I, I would ditto that. It's well, there's a lot of things, but people love each other. They always want to get together and have fun. They always, there's always like, I'm going to a baptism of my uh, grandson uh, in a week and a half. And they've been holding the baptism for when Rory can get in because they can't have it. I mean, it's the sense of family is, is really um, amazing to me, you know? So that and uh, the sense of uh, love of food. I mean, people are so particular about where they eat and how things, are. they taste their gumbo and if it, you know, it's five minutes too old or they didn't put enough pepper in it. I mean, it's, it reminds me a lot of Paris in that way. Uh, the, the enjoyment of things that are sensual and you know, that's it. That's a great answer. Um, there's another way that you're both involved with Degas. If I'm correct, it's Degas, the impressionable years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that project, where people can learn more about it, what exactly it is. Right. Sure. Well, we we were really inspired by the story when we wrote a screenplay, because, you know, when you write nonfiction, you have to, and as an academic, I know you have to always cite your literature, mm -hmm. um, but when you get to write fiction, it was really exciting. So uh, we wrote the screenplay. It's actually was inspired by Rosary's play, To God in New Orleans, published by Samuel French about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and she also published a novel, too. Uh, called My Brother's Wife, Degas Paints New Orleans. Um, you can find both of those on Amazon. But um, we created this this film script together because you, we wanted to see have people watch and see this experience and see New Orleans and see these relationships we were talking about and really feel it. I think that right now we live in a very visual uh, world where people want to see. So we, we're working with uh, our producer, Carol Bedeau de Lille, who's actually at the Cannes Film Festival right now, um, she runs Media Fusion and um, Seren, two different um, production companies. And so we're hoping to uh, have Degas uh, it, it, as a film um, in the coming years. So we're really excited about it. That's wonderful. Um, in addition to everything that you've done, I was, well, I was surprised by the breadth of your, both of your work. Um, I 
was in the bookstore, The Poison Pen, and I discovered another book by you, Rory, about Hopi and Navajo art. Mm. Uh, is there no end to <laughs> the fields that you're willing to uh, explore? What about Hopi and Navajo art? Because that's a very Arizona thing. So I thought this is definitely something people would be interested in. Sure. Yes. Uh, my first book was Navajo and Hopi art, um, uh, continuing traditions in Arizona. And, you know, when I moved to Arizona, my husband, the Sanjmit is actually from Snowflake, Arizona, but we, we moved to Phoenix and uh, I visited the Herd Museum here, which I'm sure you know, and did one of the tours. And I was so blown away by the history of indigenous culture just in the Southwest in this region that I signed up uh, to become a docent and did their training program to really learn more about native histories and people here. Um, and that influenced, you know, I studied uh, at Arizona State University for my PhD. It influenced my dissertation where I interviewed museum educator and curators. Um, and then yeah, I wrote the book. So just really curious about why people make art, um, how they make art, what it means to them, is spirituality influenced by uh, what what they're making? And and I really want to bring really talented contemporary artists too in Arizona to the forefront. So someone like Marlo Catoni, who's an incredible weaver, um, mm. showing showing artists today. You know, mm. Edgar Degas made art 150 years ago, which is incredible. But people are making art right now too, and there's there's a reason for that. And I hope that we can celebrate and learn more. It's, great. it's a fascinating book. You really do introduce the topic so well. Um, before we run out of time, I do have one question that may be challenging for both of you. So if you don't want to um, address it, that's fine. But if you had to pick what would be your favorite piece of artwork that Degas produced, do you have a favorite? Hmm. I, I, right now, for me, it's the portrait of a woman on a balcony. Um, mm -hmm. because this is a portrait of one of his female cousins, either Mathilde or Estelle, uh, Moussan Degas. I think it's Estelle. Uh, the, there's beautiful, uh, the balcony, you can see the ironwork of the balcony. A lot of women and Creole women spent a lot of time on the balcony because it was an in-between outside and inside world. Um, and I'm fascinated with artwork because who he's painted, it's still kind of unknown. Um, but I think that it's a step. So that was one of my exciting pieces. Yeah, and, and the architecture of New Orleans is so phenomenal. If you haven't visited them, I mean, the balconies, uh, the porches, the 20 foot ceiling rooms, I mean, the huge mantles, I mean, all this stuff that we it, we look at, it's sort of gawk at. So, uh, but of the paintings, I have to say the portrait of Estelle at the museum because it sort of captures the the transition that Edgar went through from painting outside watercolor to really an interior look at a woman who is stealing herself for the worst. Mm -hmm. I just loved it. I think mm -hmm. it's great. And then the use of flowers, which is of course so New Orleans because there's blossoms everywhere that sort of lift the soul and women and people who grieve the use of flowers in grief. So I just love that. And, um, one thing to add to this portrait of Estelle is the one painting that Degas made that it still remains in New Orleans is at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And next month, we're actually going to lecture about the book in front of this painting. And it just feels like a dream to, um, to be involved with the New Orleans Museum of Art. Congratulations. That's really going to be an exciting treat for those people there. Um, if, do you want to say anything about what's next in the works for you, or should that remain a mystery? Go, oh, Rory. We are writing a book about Kate Chopin um, in New Orleans. And she was, I don't know why I'm whispering, but <laughs> she was in Louisiana uh, for about 14 years. She arrived in 1870 as a, a young bride from St. Louis, Missouri. And um, as you know, she came to become one of the most uh, important female novelists of America with the book she wrote in 1809, The Awakening. So we're really getting into her world, her Creole world in New Orleans and mm -hmm. in Cuchiville, Louisiana. And that's, that's what our research is. We're actually going to be interviewing one of her descendants this afternoon for our research. Oh, great. Um, is there a way for people to learn more about your work? I know that you're not really a traditional 
publish or more academic, but do you have websites? Are you on social media? Um, how can people learn about your work? Um, I have a website. It's uh, RoryO'NealSchmidt.com that has more about the different works. Uh, Rosary, yours is RoseryO'Neal.com. Original Productions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the publisher, definitely looking up History Press or Narcata Publishing for more of our books. And we're, we're both on Facebook and Instagram. So we'd love to connect with, with people. That's mm -hmm. great. I can't believe how quickly um, our time has flown by. The Poison Pen has really been terribly honored to have with us today authors Rory Schmidt and Rosary O'Neill, whose new book is Edgar Degas in New, or new Orleans. Um, it's filled with facts, and yet I also want to say a quick read in the best possible sense. You're not going to be bored by any means. Um, I want to thank Rosary and Rory for joining us. I want to thank those of you tuning in to another virtual author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John Charles. Thank you.